on a desktop device. And we did that uh, via specifying two CSS files. And I had mentioned that you can actually specify more, and I swear I had that going over the weekend, but I'm not able to recreate it. So we'll just we'll skip for that. You can, you can try it in lab if you want, uh, or on, on any of your assignments. And the idea is that we do this. We specify a base CSS file that everyone gets. That is, everyone that gets CSS will get this file, which is most every browser. Now, on the odd chance that someone has an ancient phone that has a browser that does not support CSS, then they'll just get the same basic HTML view. All right. We then have a basic CSS file that everyone is going to get and we add on top of that, then, for people with an enhanced machine, we add on top of that a second sort of tier, if you will, that will go in and say, okay, if their device at least has a minimum width of 801 pixels, all right, that they get this style on top of it. And then we can make it more involved. So let's take a look at what we did last time and talk a little bit about the kind of thing that we would do. Notice that this coexists very nicely with the notion of having uh, fluid grids and the notion of having resizable images. All right. One thing about this class is this class presents a, a bunch of tools that you can use and we'll continue to add to our tool set. All right. It's not as though one of the tools supersedes the other one. All right. It's that they can be used in conjunction together. Let me give you an example. Uh, pretty soon, I don't know about this week or next week, we're going to talk about using server-side scripting or even client-side scripting to tweak a page differently for a mobile device um, than for a desktop. And at some point, we're going to talk about redirecting people, having a web page have sort of a traffic cop that sends some people to the mobile page, some people to the desktop page. When we do that, we're still going to use these techniques, probably on both sides. We're still going to use the techniques of progressive enhancement because mobile and desktop are very wide uh, categories. You know, not every mobile device is the same. All right. There's big differences among the screen size and, and, and capabilities of different mobile devices. So we're still going to, on the mobile side and even on the desktop side, we're still going to take advantage of these fluid techniques because these are just good design principles. The flexible for uh, the, the, that's responsive to the different uh, screen sizes. So let's look at this, you know, basic screen if they have at least minimum width of 801 pixels. So let's go, let's fire up the emulator, or let's first of all view this uh, in the desktop browser. <coughs> we see here is sort of the full page. Notice it is three columns, it has a background image, it has a image of a, a leaf on the page, and so on down the line. We could have any kind of capabilities. This is meant to represent a more fully featured page with more capabilities, more content, and so on. If we open up the emulator, Again, we can open up an emulator. Let's do it with a fairly lower end phone, this one. All right. If we launch that, that is 320 by 480 pixels. If we go and drag our page into the emulator, you'll see playing around with something. You'll see that's how it looks, which again is quite a bit different than what we had before, than that. 
Now, some of these things come from our fluid design. So, for example, the one column comes from the fluid design. Um, or rather from the base CSS file. The fact that there's no image, is that we don't add that because this style sheet doesn't apply, we don't add that style code to have uh, an image for that, for the background for that. No image appears on this because again, no background image nor an image of the leaf because again, we hide that code. So the one thing I would suggest doing if, you, if you're not uh, entirely comfortable is really spend the time to brush up on your CSS coding. All right, Be sure that you're familiar with that and practice that and know that well. There's the base one and if you notice we set the width of everything to uh, 100%. That'll make it one column no matter how big the mobile device is. If you're getting the mobile version of it, you're getting one column. We then, however, in our full page, um, where's that CSS? The desktop CSS, which I thought I opened. Yeah. That's where we do the width and the floating and all that. So we're using, it's, we're using the responsive techniques in actually the desktop version so that as the page resizes, the columns float around and all that. Let me take one last attempt at this, at what I wanted to do and show a third a style sheet coming into play. Let's do something like this. Let's make an emulator for a pretty big screen mobile device. And right now we're still don't know why that is not showing up red. Because again, what I'm saying is if the minimum device is 481 pixels, then um, I'm, I should apply this third style sheet, which is a mobile one, which is going to set the background of the page to red. So I'm not sure why that isn't working. It could be a bug with the emulator. I'm not going to spend time wrestling with that uh, today. So we'll get rid of it. I would suggest, by the way, you know, an emulator is an emulator. An emulator is an imitation of an environment. Therefore, it's important to go and test your pages on an actual mobile device. Um, and we'll talk about how to do that um, at some point uh, throughout the term. What I will likely do is I will likely give you space on a web server here at LC and what you'll be able to do is upload your pages to the web server and then you'll be able to use the phone that I have or the tablets that I have to access the page so you can view it in, in those environments as well. The two other things that are in this, again, we have a hack for Firefox and we have a hack for Internet Explorer. Both of these are because earlier versions of Firefox and Internet Explorer don't support the HTML5 stuff that I'm doing. All right. Therefore, I have to put those in. The first one, the one that's named ff.css, goes and uh, lets Firefox understand, understand the HTML5 tags. The um, HTML shiv is a little JavaScript uh, snippet that I did not write. Um, it is available on the web. And I put it in there, and that makes uh, earlier versions of Internet Explorer understand um, HTML5 things. One thing about media queries, there's another way you can actually put the media query right in your style sheet. You don't have to have a separate style sheet. And we'll take a look at that. Let's see. It's on page 61 in your text.
might be a little hard to, to see. But if you notice that, again, what they do is you can actually embed this code in your style sheet. So I actually could get by with having a single style sheet, all right, and just have the media queries built within it. I generally avoid that technique. I typically make two style sheets. That makes it very clear. It's harder for me to read through one style sheet that might have some desktop code and later on might have some mobile code in there or vice versa. All right. So my preference would be to have them broken up between two style sheets. But whatever works for you, you can, you can add these elements. Again, another tool in the tool chest that you can go uh, and add. So we're adopting the philosophy of mobile first, which means that we have a bare bones style sheet and then we go and we add functionality based on the platform that we're on. Uh, and therefore we add additional style sheets uh, based on that. All right. Um, There's a couple other tools that we're going to have, or, or that we have at our disposal, that we're, we're going to discuss. All right? Let's kind of draw a chart. And again, keep in mind that, that these, um, none of these things supersede each other. All these things sort of work uh, together. All right? So we have two strategies that we can take. We have two strategies, and then we have a set of tools that sort of fill in either way. All right. One strategy is one page with multiple CSS. And that's the strategy we've taken so far. We have one page and we have multiple CSS and then through the media query we choose which CSS gets applied in that case. Another choice is to have a traffic comp and to have a redirection page that redirects the users to two separate pages. One for mobile and one for desktop. Now, as I said before, the things that we're studying are techniques. So these pages themselves might have multiple style sheets that use media queries. All right? So what I want to do is I want to run down a list of things that we're going to be able to do and going to do, and then we're going to look at, like, how that gets implemented. All right? First of all, we have fluid grids. We're going to do that all the time, regardless if we're doing desktop or mobile or we're doing one page or multiple pages. We're going to do fluid grids. Likewise, fluid images. We're going to do all the time. Media queries is a must for the one page approach. It's a probably for the multiple page approach. So even when we talk about how to direct people to two different pages, those two separate pages are likely to be using media queries. All right? Client side scripting to customize a page. We'll do that sometimes in either of these contexts. We're going to go over a simple example of that today. And later on, we're going to go over uh, an example to make our pages uh, location aware. Uh, by later on, I mean later on in the course, not later on in the day. And we'll use JavaScript to do that.
when we, uh, we can do client side, we can also do server side scripting to customize a page. We're definitely going to do that in our redirect page. And we're sometimes going to do that otherwise. Other tools. Querying the capabilities of the device. All right. For example, I can make a phone call on a phone. All right. I can make a phone call on a mobile device, even if it's a tablet, or if, if the mobile device is a tablet. Even though it's considered a mobile device, I can't make a phone call on it. Not likewise, I cannot make a phone call on a desktop computer. All right. So there I'm not really telling, I'm not really detecting whether it's a mobile device or a desktop, and I'm not really detecting the screen size. I'm querying the capabilities of the phone. All right. And we'll see examples on how to do this. Specifically, this is going to be more relevant in the mobile environment. If it has a phone available, for example, we're going to go and, and use that. Likewise, if it has a GPS available, we're going to use that. All these things I would fall under the category of querying the device um, as to what its capabilities are. Then depending on the capability of the device, doing something different. Lastly, we're going to use a jQuery mobile framework. And this, even though the word is jQuery mobile, we can actually use it for mobile or desktop pages. All right. Now again, the important thing about this is that we can mix and match these different things and different elements. All right, we can piece together um, from all these different techniques that I've described here, we can piece together a solution. Generally speaking, that solution is going to look like one of these two, either one page that gets served both to mobile and desktop devices or a redirection page that sends people one of two places. What I want to do now is I want to pull up an example of... How I can write a responsive page using JavaScript. I don't think this is in the book, at least not this specific example, I don't believe, is in the book. So I'll pull it up and we'll take a look at it. How many of you have done any JavaScript programming? None? Okay. Well, I'll show you what it is, then we'll rewind and we will discuss what JavaScript is and what it sort of adds to, to the party. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, let's go over this example to get an example of, of how JavaScript could be used. And then we will go and we'll talk in more general terms of what the capabilities of JavaScript is. All right. Well, that's not the right page.
this is the one I want. All right. Here we have, and again, this is, this is me just playing around with some things, just to illustrate sort of the capabilities of JavaScript, and then we'll look at a bigger view of what JavaScript is. Here I have two divs, one that says I'm important, one that says I'm less important. All right, imagine this to be content on a website, you know. Um, there would be the stuff that would be considered to be very important that you would want to be displayed in any environment. And then there's less stuff that, hey, if there's space for it, we'll put it in there. Uh, but if not, we don't need to worry about it. Now, notice what happens as I resize this. All right. Now I admit that's not terribly purposeful, but it is interesting to illustrate a point. The fact that I'm actually changing the color of that div depending on the size of the screen. The smaller the screen is, the darker it gets. All right? And when I get a certain point, that second div disappears altogether. Okay? So it's not like I'm using a percentage and making it like a certain, you know, percent uh, or, or whatever. I'm actually going in and when the screen reaches a certain point, that div disappears. Let's view this in the emulator and see how it would look. Let's go and pull up an emulator here. Well, that, that's at the size, apparently, where um, both of them still appear. Let's pull up a smaller size screen. Let's pick up the lowest end phone that we got here. Yeah, there we go. Tiny, tiny phone. Oh. Still shows. Well, we'll have to see why that's showing. Maybe we can tweak the code a little bit. All right, let's look at the code here. And I put everything in the one file just for convenience. All right. Notice we have a couple things here. I have code that says on load. I have code on the body that says on load and on resize. That is how JavaScript gets invoked. We have events on our different elements of the page. What are some examples of events? On click is an event. When you click on a button, you want something to happen. So an on click is an event uh, that we can write some JavaScript for. On key down, when the user presses a key in a text box, we could write some JavaScript code. Have you ever seen a web page that does something when you start typing? Yeah, you've seen that all along, more than likely, if you've ever used Google. If I go to Google and I Google something, if I start typing in P, notice it brings up the top thing on the list, that of its database it starts with P and it shows me four choices. The four most popular things in the world that start with P are Pinterest, Pandora, Pizza Hut, and PayPal. That's a good, good choice of things, all right. As I type in the next letter and type in PH, it shows me the list of the four most common things that start with PH. If I type PHP, then it shows me the four things that start with PHP. So obviously something is going on triggered based on when the user presses a key. All right? And that's what's known as an event. So an event in, in JavaScript is typically what invokes 
the JavaScript to go in and occur, to, do, to go and happen. All right? So clicking a button can be an event. Pressing a key can be an event. Putting your mouse over something can be an event. Notice as I put my mouse over, that little submenu underneath it changes. All these things are events. Now, in this case, I have code for two events. All right? I have an onload event, which is used to, um, which fires off when the page is initially loaded. I then have an on resize event that occurs when the screen is resized. So, if I go and bring this up in my browser, bring this page up in my browser, boom, there was the on load. And now the on resize event is occurring. So when the page first loads, as the page resizes. Okay. In both cases, what's in quotes is the JavaScript function that I call. Okay? The JavaScript function that I call. And in both cases, the function is called redisplay. All right. So whether I first open up the page or I resize the page, it calls a function called redisplay. Let's look at what that function does. The JavaScript code is in a script tag. All right. Script tag is similar to the style tag in HTML in the sense that what's defined within the script tag is JavaScript, not regular HTML. Just like what's defined within the style tag is CSS code and not HTML. We define a function like this. The word function, the name of the function, a parenthesis in case there's any arguments, and then we have the braces, the beginning and end. Those braces go around the function. The braces go serve the purpose of grouping code. Now, a couple of you have me in uh, the, the Android development class. And this is where it's kind of a good news situation, right? Because we're, write, we're writing code all the same style, all right? Um, when we shifted from Visual Basic to C Sharp as our introductory programming language, one of the big wins with that is all the languages we're using code the same style. So in other words, whether you're talking about C Sharp or whether you're talking about JavaScript or whether you're talking about Java, or whether you're talking about PHP coding, they all use the braces the same way. Now, that's not to say that the, the languages are identical. You know, far from that. But the sort of general rules of the language are consistent between them. So the nice thing is, is it's not like back in Visual Basic where you had to learn if, then, and if. You know, the and then when you come to Java, there's a different syntax. Here, all the if statements are going to look like if statements that you have in any of your other programming classes here. So that's sort of the good news. Now, what is this monstrosity of code? This monstrosity of code does two things. This snippet up through here checks the size of the window and it creates a variable called winw that contains how many pixels wide the pages. All right.
I didn't write this code. This code was written with um, browser compatibility in mind. So determining how wide a window is isn't the straightforward question that you might think it would be. From here down is where my code is. Okay. I have the if statement in here that tests to see if the window width is less than 400. If it's less than 400, I do this block of statements. Again, using the braces to group together the statements. If the window is not less than 400, if it's 400 or greater, I do this block of statements. Now, what am I doing in these statements? Well, I am setting the visibility of that element on my page called less important. What, one of the key things with JavaScript is JavaScript uses the IDs that you put on elements to point to those elements. In other words, what is it that I'm showing or hiding? This is a guy that I'm either showing or hiding. All right? That's the guy that I'm either showing or hiding. So we need a way to point to that thing on our page to do something with. All right? So, how do we point to it? We point to the things on our page using the ID. All right? Your student ID number. All right? You should be the only student at LC that has that student ID number. All right? Whatever your value is. There aren't two people that have it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be any good, right? Because it wouldn't really identify you. You know? If two people had the same ID, who do they send the bill to? You know, when that ID registers for a class. Who gets credit for the classes? Who gets the diploma? All right? An ID doesn't work unless it's unique. That is, there's only one thing in the population that has it. Same idea with IDs on a web page. My IDs are going to be used to uniquely identify things on the page. And in this case, I have an ID for the less important one, and I have an ID for the more important one. So what I'm doing here is, if the width of the window, again, this is their code up to this point, I'm simply looking at the width that that code returns, and if the width of the window is less than 400, I want to find the thing on the page that has an ID of less important. That's this section of this statement. Document means I want to look on this page. All right. You actually can look on other pages. You can look on pop-ups that you pop up or, or whatever. Well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to look at any pop-ups or anything. I want to look on this page. On this page, I want to find the thing that has a certain ID. And in this case, the ID is less important. So document, get element by ID, is going to point to this div, that chunk of code. All right? Now that I'm pointing to that particular chunk of code, that particular HTML element, I can change anything I want to about that element. All right? I can change anything I want to about that element. Well, what I'm interested in changing in this point is I'm interested in changing the visibility. So how do I change the visibility? Well, I point to that element on the screen. The visibility of an element is, the as is, is an aspect of the appearance of it, right? It's not the content. Whether you see it or not, that's an aspect of the appearance. Therefore, I want to change the style of it. What property do I want to set? I want to set the visibility style. And what do I want to set it to? I want to set it to hidden, all right? If it's not less than 400, I want to do the same thing, 
That is, I want to point to that div that has an ID of less important. I want to change the style. I want to change the visibility. But instead, I want to make it visible as opposed to invisible. So, up to here, we're determining the width of the screen and we are the width of the page, and we're storing that in a variable called win uh, w. Here we're writing an if statement, and the way if statements work are we define a condition. If it's true, we do this one. If it's false, we do this one. So when the window width is less than 400, this kicks in, and we go in and we make it invisible. Otherwise, we make it visible. Now, here just for laughs, and again, this, we'll, I'll post this code, but it's, this, is more, this is more a demonstration of the capabilities of, of JavaScript more than anything really practical. All right? The first bit about hiding certain things when it gets a certain size, that might be something I might actually use. Um, changing the color of something based on the window width, though, is something eh, I don't necessarily see myself doing too often. All right? But anyhow, what am I doing? That important div, I'm changing the font size, and I'm changing the background color. How am I changing it? Well, I'm taking whatever the width is, whoops, and divide it by 400, and setting it to that many M. If you remember in CSS, M is like, stands for emphasis. So 2M means twice as big as normal. 1M would be the, the normal font. So for example, if the window width was 1,200 pixels, 1,200 divided by 400 would be 3. So if this was a 1,200 pixel monitor, the, the, the font size would be uh, 3M. If this was, if I resize the window to be 800 pixels big, then it would be 800 divided by 400, or 2M, and it would be twice as big. When it gets to be 400 pixels, all right, it will be 400 divided by 400, or 1M. RGB, I do a similar thing for. I take the width of the screen and divide it by 4. Why did I pick four? Well, because typical screen might be around 1,000 wide. 1,000 divided by four is 250. 250 is kind of all the way turned on. The light, you know, the, the red, green, and blue light is, is sort of close to the maximum value. So I set the RGB to whatever the width is divided by four. So as it gets smaller, when W becomes smaller, and therefore I set smaller and smaller numbers, and therefore um, it becomes darker and darker. And that disappears. All right. So, how is this relevant? Putting JavaScript code in my HTML document is another way, a different way to make my page responsive. Remember, the whole point of these responsive or adaptive pages is to respond to the size, the shape, the environment that the page is being displayed in. Specifically, what's most relevant for us now is, is the screen size or the window size. All right? That's why we do things based on percentages. If we make it an absolute pixel, then it's not going to change at all. It won't be responsive or adaptive. If we make it based on a percentage, whether we're talking about the images or whether we're talking about the width of the different things on the page, then it will be responsive because as we as we change the size of these th uh, of the window, those elements will correspondingly become smaller or bigger. All right. So by putting in percentages instead of absolute numbers, that's one way to make our page responsive. That's what we've seen, you know, from the first class on. 
A second way to make our page responsive is by having uh, media queries with CSS. And that's what we did. One kind of page gets one style sheet. Another kind of page gets two style sheets, right? Because it gets the basic one plus it gets the desktop one. Going back to the example that we were looking at earlier. So again, the page isn't static. The page reacts to its environment. Depending on how it's being viewed, it displays one way or another. This is a third way to make it responsive. All right? Um, and that is through our JavaScript code. Our JavaScript code, via our JavaScript code, we can change any aspect of the page based on any number of different things that the user does. In this particular case, we are changing the way the page is displayed based on when the user resizes the window. Which, if you think for responsive design, makes a lot of sense, right? Because with responsive design, we want the page to change when they resize it. And in this case, there's nothing really we could do within CSS or uh, percentages to make this work the way that we want to. We want it to hit a certain size and then disappear. So therefore, we use the JavaScript. Let's rewind for a second. Now that we've seen a specific example of JavaScript, let's sort of rewind and talk about JavaScript in a more general sense. And again, um, you all, I believe, have had me for CISS 216, the web development class. All right. So we did hit on that. We did touch on that. Depending on what semester we had, we did either more or less. I, I, don't, I don't really recall. JavaScript, again, is a way to add behavior to the page. All right? We have three main web standard technologies. that all support each other and all are responsible for doing different things. We have HTML, which is responsible for the content of the page. And it's also responsible for what I will call the logical structure. What I mean by logical structure is we have a set of links, for example, that we group together to form a navigation section. All right. We have a set of um, paragraphs that we call our content section, and so on down the line. So we logically group those things together to form a unit, either by divs or by the HTML5 um, tags. CSS is responsible for the appearance and the physical layout. So what do I mean by appearance? I mean like, you know, what colors things are, what fonts I'm using, and so on and so forth. There are some tags in HTML that allow you to use HTML tags to set the appearance of the page or HTML attributes. We're never going to use those because that limits the flexibility of what you can do. And it makes it much harder to maintain. Yes. The closer to the element, the more dominant it would be. So a CSS inline style would take precedence over an external style sheet. Um, actually, uh, an inline style like that, I avoid those. All right. Generally, what I use is I will either use an external style sheet, and in some rare cases, if I am virtually sure I don't want to reuse it, I'll have an internal style sheet in the page. But I very, very rarely, unless I'm sort of in a real hurry or cheating or whatever, use uh, an inline style. How would you make, like, say you have high school, okay? Uh -huh. If you wanted to make high like a blue and school like white or a yellow color. Okay. I, used, I think I used a span on the high to change the color. And then the span on the, the school to change it to white. 
Yeah. The question was, is what if we had a phrase like high school that we wanted to change different colors? How would, I, how would you do that? I would probably do it much in the same way that you did. You could do span That's probably how I would do it. I'd give use the school and the high. Yeah, as as IDs. Oh. Yeah. Now, this is one of those cases where, you know, th there's always the like the purest viewpoint and then there's like the practical thing. Something like this, something like that, you know, if you use an embedded style probably wouldn't be that that horrible. All right. So like if you put an inline style there, that's probably not that that huge of a deal. All right. Back to this, content, appearance, and physical layout. I guess what I'm saying is not having any appearance in here. I'm, I'm saying like not use any font tags, for example, which are like old HTML tags. Or not using even tags like a background color on the body or something like that. Use the CSS uh, instead because right, that gives you just so much more flexibility to, to do these uh, things. What does JavaScript do? It provides behavior, specifically interactive behavior. Another way of saying interactive is responsive. The user does something, the page responds in a certain way. So there's some interaction there. So in that example we gave, the user resizes the screen, the divs resize themselves, that was just purely in CSS, but at a certain point, if the user resizes it, if it gets smaller than a certain size, the one div disappears. Likewise, if it gets smaller than a certain, or um, as it resizes, the uh, color of the other div changes. So it responds. User resizes the screen, the color of the div changes and the one div at a certain point disappears. Now, let's talk about the wins of JavaScript. Because in addition to writing JavaScript, we are also going to look at, at some point, some server-side scripting. And we want to be sure that we understand the difference between the two. Um, before we, before we get too heavily deep into either of them. All right? That's what brings us, uh, will bring us to this diagram where the client, this is something I use in almost all of my classes, connects to a web server via the internet request the page either by clicking on a link or typing in an address in an address bar. That request makes it through the internet, however it makes it through the internet. Hits the appropriate web server. The web server finds the page and sends that back through the internet to the client that requested it. So. I go here and I type in ESPN.com or let's type MSN.com, MSN.com, all right. When I press the enter, all right, right now I'm on the client. When I press the enter, that's going to send my request. The browser is going to make that request through the internet. It's going to go through the internet, get routed to MSN's web server. MSN's web server is going to get the files together that are needed for that page, send it back to me, and the copies of those files are going to come to me, the client, and will be displayed. All right. A lot happens when you press enter. 
right? I press enter. When you consider all this happening, that's amazing how quick it is, right? Because you actually have my request not going directly to MSN's server, all right, but going through a convoluted path through the internet. You know, take a networking class or ask Don Huffman or Doug Huber how it gets there. But it gets there. That's all we're concerned about is it gets there. All right? So it gets there. The web server thinks about it for a while, then sends me back the page that I request. And it gets displayed on my machine. So all those files get sent back to my machine. Now, here's where the value of JavaScript comes, uh, comes from in contrast with server-side scripting. When this comes back, what gets delivered to me are those three client technologies. Wherever they went. Here they are. What comes back to me are these three things. Some HTML, some CSS, and some JavaScript. So that package gets delivered back to me. So the HTML that has the content of the page. The CSS which describes the appearance of the page. And finally, the JavaScript which controls the behavior of the page. So, what's the implication of that? The implication of that is this. Notice how quickly, when I put my mouse over these certain things, that that changes. You know, virtually instantaneously, as I put my mouse over these things, the submenu down there changes. That's even quicker than when I reload the page. When I reload the page, it has to think about it a few seconds, right? Because it has to go through the internet, go there, and come back. And depending on a lot of factors, you know, the speed of what's going on, the, the speed of the internet. Is there a particular uh, problem with the internet or with your internet service provider or with your connection to the internet? Um, I had a, a case where our internet uh, at home was getting progressively slower and slower, all right? When we called uh, the, the, uh, whoever was doing our internet at the time, what they found is the, thing, the stuff that they coat the wires with is apparently very tasty to squirrels. And the squirrels were nibbling on the wires, and therefore the wires were becoming progressively more and more frayed, which means that sometimes stuff went through, sometimes it didn't, right? Because typically, you know, if you request something, it sends it. If the data doesn't come back okay, it retries it, and, you know, if it comes through the first time, you're getting good speed. If, if there's a few retries, then, then it's not going to come back uh, as good. But the point is, is once it gets on my computer, then this JavaScript code that lives here is instantaneous, because it's on my computer. It doesn't have to travel through the wires through to MSNBC server and then back, all right? Which again, happens at an amazing speed when you consider all that's going on, but does take a visible time lag. And again, depending on the web page that we go to and depending on conditions on the internet, it's, even on a fast connection, it can be visible, you know? If I go to ESPN.com, trying to think of a page that's long to load. Notice, all right, okay, all right, that took a while to load. We'll go to Yahoo, let's say. All right, um, what did you say, N gadget?
All right, that's a good example. The point is, is this visible loading? All right, because this round trip has to happen. Has to go through there to the web server and back. However, once it gets loaded, we'll go back to the MSN site. Once it does get loaded, then the JavaScript can work instantaneously. It's actually still loading, that's why it's... Once it gets loaded, the JavaScript happens instantaneously. So that's the win of JavaScript. The win of JavaScript is that it gets loaded to our computer when the web page gets loaded. Which means that it can run without requiring us to go back to the web server. All right, that's the win of JavaScript. All right, it takes more to load it, right? Because it's additional data that comes in, but that typically won't be that much. You know, these, these JavaScript uh, is, is not particularly um, a lot of a lot of code. All right, but the advantage is is that once it gets there, it can execute immediately. All right? Now, once it gets there and it can execute immediately, what it can do? Well, it can change any aspect of the web page however we want it. For example, if we look at these menus, really what it's doing is it's showing and hiding these submenus as we put our mouse on these different things. In other words, when we load this page, we, we don't see anything. When we load this page, we only see one submenu. But all those submenus are there. All right. Well, why do we only see one? Because the CSS is set to invisible for the other ones. So the one that we're looking at is visible. The rest of them are invisible. As we go and we move our mouse across, all the JavaScript does is something very similar to what our JavaScript did in our example. It hides everything and shows the one. Just like ours, depending on the width of the page, would hide the one element. All right. Now that kind of thing can happen immediately. So really the big advantage of JavaScript is that it gets loaded on the client machine and the client machine then can go and execute that code immediately and change the page based on the user's actions. All right. Now we're not done with this. This is just sort of an overview and we'll come back to this probably throughout the course and we'll add different pieces of it. Just as there's JavaScript, which is code that runs on the client, there's also server-side scripting that runs on the web server. All right. The problem with this JavaScript is you're limited to what the capabilities are. You can't do all the cool things that you can do with server-side scripting. So this will work for some things, like showing and hiding menus, but it won't work for other things. And for those other things, you need the server-side scripting. Now, to sort of give a preview of the server-side scripting, let's go to our friend Google. And let's type in Italian restaurant. And let's see what it shows. It shows us the Olive Garden on West River. It showed us peppers, wherever that is. Carabas, Angelina's Pizza, Little Caesars, Marco's. How lucky we are that we have the best Italian restaurants in the world because when we type those in Google, those are on the top of the list. Well, are those really the best Italian restaurants in the world? If you were in New York City and you typed that in for Italian restaurants, would you see the list of Illyria's Olive Garden? Probably not. All right. So what's happening? What's happening is our search results are being geared specifically for us. All right. 
it knows based on a number of factors or based on a, a number of, of things, it knows where we are. And therefore, it customizes the search for us. All right? So in other words, when I request a page living in or sitting here in Illyria, when I Google Italian restaurants, it returns me a different HTML than if I were, say, in New York City and I were to Google it. This is sort of evidence that the web server can actually customize a page for you based on what it knows about you. And what does it know about you? Well, that's a good question. Uh, depending on the context, it can know things from cookies, things that you've done before, things and so on. The one thing it can definitely tell from you, though, is it can tell your IP address. In other words, where you're coming from. It can tell what your user agent is. That is, what kind of browser you're using. And from that information, it can decide if you're on a mobile device or on a desktop device. So just as we can write code on JavaScript to customize the page depending on certain parameters, we can write code on the server side to look and see certain information about the user and based on that information, serve them up different search results or different things. All right. We're going to use this approach when we talk about server redirection. In other words, the web server, if I request a page, if I request LC's page, LC's web server decides, looks at my request and says, hey, that person's on a mobile device, or hey, that person's on a desktop. Depending on the device that the user's on, it will give you one page or it will give you another page. All right? So in that sense, it's responsive. It, depend, it looks at the environment that you're in and customizes based on that environment. So we'll continue to look at <clears throat> customizing the pages based on client-side scripting and server-side scripting. Are there any questions? I do apologize for the late posting of your next homework assignment. Um, it should be posted now. Um, let me know if you have any questions. My, you know, if you could get it done by this Friday, that would be great. Let's, let's shoot for that as a goal. If you're having difficulty with that, uh, you know, let me know and we can, we can uh, talk about it. All right.